Scotland and Northern Ireland. But northerly winds setting in, bringing uh, more showers across the far north of Scotland, falling as snow uh, at times across the Northern Isles. No chance of that. Further south, it'll be rain and drizzle because it is really mild here, 11, 12 degrees Celsius. But it is turning colder again across northern Britain with those winds starting to pick up once more. Though generally the winds, uh, certainly for northern England, northern Ireland, are a lot lighter than yesterday. During this evening, I think we're not going to see a great deal of change. Those northerly winds still bringing some showers in across northern Scotland. It might turn a bit icy as temperatures fall away, but further south it stays murky, misty again. Some fog in places and rain returning to the far southwest by the end of the night. Very mild here. Temperatures may stay in double figures, but colder conditions setting in further north. And that north-south split continues into Friday morning. This band of rain could be pretty heavy. A lot of people hitting the roads on Friday, so just bear that in mind. It's going to generate a lot of spray and surface water spreading from south to north, getting into northern England and northern Ireland, southern Scotland by the end of the day. Further south, it should brighten up during Friday afternoon. Still pretty mild here as well, although it will at times be windy. And again, got that big contrast between north and south. Low single figures across the uh, north, much milder conditions further south. The milder air winds out through the Christmas period for all areas, mostly looking fairly grey for Christmas, but then it could well turn colder and brighter during Christmas Day from the northwest. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations. For helping our great nation find its voice, we are here for you on radio, television and online. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. 
Freeview Channel 236. And you view Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Today we learn the UK economy contracted by more than was previously thought over the last quarter. It seems certain we're heading for recession over the next. The question is, what can be done to mitigate it, to avoid it? Can anything be done to save our dire economic straits? That's this morning and we're talking fertility. Why are so few babies being born? Also, the elected House of Lords, it's a smorgasbord of topics. Stay with us after the news. Good morning, it's 9.31. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. Train passengers are being warned their Christmas getaway could be jeopardised after network rail workers in Scotland announced strike action. Major disruptions expected from 6pm on Saturday until Tuesday morning, with more planned in the new year. Air travel's also set to be affected, with Border Force staff walking off the job tomorrow, striking every day until January the 1st, except for next Tuesday. Meanwhile, health leaders are warning of knock-on effects following this week's NHS strikes. The Telegraph says the government's now looking to fast-track a pay rise to avert fresh action. Scotland's Shadow Health Minister, Dr Sandesh Ghislaine, said says money isn't the only issue. Patient safety also needs to be addressed. Imagine if you guys were going to work or your viewers were going to work and not knowing if that day somebody was going to die because of something that you couldn't control because there was a lack of support, because uh, there, there was a lack of equipment, because there was a lack of things going on that would have meant that somebody died. It'd be terrifying. National Highways workers in London and South East England are also striking, walking out today until Christmas Day. The public and commercial services unions acknowledge the action will likely inconvenience travellers. But it's blaming the government for ma making a below inflation pay offer. Further actions planned for next week and in the new year, unless a deal can be reached. A controversial gender reform bill looks set to finally be passed in Scotland later today following days of debate and protests. MSPs argued into the early hours of the morning at Holyrood as they considered over 150 amendments. The bill will reduce the time required for applicants to live as their required gender from two years to three months. It will also lower the minimum age to 16. And Ukraine's president has told the U.S. Congress his country is alive and kicking. President Joe Biden told Vladimir Zelensky Americans will stand proudly with the Ukrainian people through its war with Russia for as long as it takes. It's been 300 days since President Vladimir Putin launched his invasion. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to the briefing with Tom. A very good morning to you. It's 9.34 and this is The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, on your TV and your radio. Now, first this morning, the United Kingdom economy shrank by more than was first thought in the three months to September. Revised Office for National Statistics data also showed that output fell by 0.3% compared to a previous estimate of 0.2%. Might not sound like a lot, but just how significant is this? The growth figures for the first half of 2022 have been revised down. It's not a pretty picture as we enter the year ahead and potentially a recession with the next quarter of growth. Well, I'm delighted to be uh, joined now by The Economist and co-founder and co-director of Regionally, an online investment environment. Justin Urquhart-Stewart joins me in Good the morning. studio. Good morning. Um, are we doomed? 
<laughs> no, we're not doomed. But what we are going to be seeing, there probably will be a recession. And all these figures are constantly being revised and changed. We've, we've probably been in a recession, actually, for some time. But recessions shouldn't be a moment where we start sucking through our tooth, teeth and say, we're doomed. Actually, it's part of a cycle. Mm -hmm. And the cycle's been uh, wrecked this time because of the banking crisis. And we're still living with the end of the banking crisis. Maybe we had interest rates so low for so long. Mm -hmm. Now we're in a position where they're having to raise rates because of inflation. But raise rates at a time when you want the economy to grow as well. Mm. You normally cut rates. This is the dilemma in the economy at the moment. So what? So the aim, first of all, from the, uh, from the Bank of England, and you'll see the same in America, cut inflation, mm. even if it means we put rates up, even if the economy starts slowing. Some people argue that perhaps a recession is necessary to break that cycle of inflation. Yep. Is that a legitimate point well, of view? Well, it's not to say to encourage it, say it's a good thing to have, but uh, what it does mean, though, is that you, you, it actually starts squeezing out possibly some of those firms which should have gone bust anyway, mm. that have been held back almost as zombie companies, um, that have been propped up by the banks because they don't want to write them off, because they write them off, it comes off their balance sheet. So, actually, it's, in many ways, it's uh, quite better for a recession, um, mm. but better to have a recession, clear out the economy, then get more investment coming into those areas where you're going to see growth. And we know where that's going to be. It'll be in those high tech companies, which we're very good at in Britain. It's really interesting, though, to see just what's going to happen in the next year and a half, potentially, the most important time for that political cycle. Yep. If we have an election in 2024, perhaps May 2024, is there going to be enough time for this government it's going for to things be, to turn around? It's going to have to be a pretty tight order. What, if it all goes well for them, they won't be seeing stunning growth. They will be able to, should be able to point to actually sit there and say, well, we went through the recessionary period, interest rates are stabilised, may come down a little bit, not by very much, mm. but we're beginning to see some more growth. But the problem is, of course, for Britain, because of what happened with Brexit and the lack of trade that we've got with the largest free trade area in the world, you know, whether you like Brexit or not, it's not the point, we are where we are, we're going to see an impact on trade on that. America is slowing down. China is slowing down. So this is a global issue overall. Mm. So what the government and, could and be doing... I suppose doing... the government hasn't yet been taking advantage of perhaps the deregulation opportunities of Brexit. We've still got all of that EU law yep. on our statute book. We've still... We haven't really been, been going gangbusters in terms of the opportunities. Well, that, and that's one of the issues. You know, you can look back and say, well, maybe uh, Mr uh, Truss was right, go for growth. But, yeah, but not describing it in the way she was trying to do it. We're, yes, we've got to go for good more growth. That does not mean necessarily more government uh, investment, mm. because governments aren't very good at that. But they can create a tax environment where people are attracted to invest more money in Britain and companies reinvesting. Mm. Over the next year, what you're going to see, those companies that are going to hurt will be those with highly indebted companies, those that borrowed a lot. Mm. So a lot of those fashion companies you've seen in the past few years, like the technology companies, they're, you can see the pain now. What you're going to see now is the rise of possibly more conservative value-based companies, uh, where they're going to be growing slowly but steadily, and that's a, that will be an encouraging sign. But the government should focus on where the future company growth comes from and those high-tech companies coming out of those tech hubs around the country. And yet we're looking at, for example, the big regulation that's going to happen to the internet, the online harm bill coming forward, yep. um, going to be probably the Online Harm Act by this time next yep. year. That's going to probably discourage some of that tech growth. Yep. Also, we're seeing the highest tax burden that we have seen on record in this country. Uh, we've got, what, 10.1%, 10 10.2% inflation as things stand. It's not a pretty environment yep. for investment. No, if, if we're going to see interest... Pro well, sorry, inflation will probably drop next mm. year. Uh, we probably we may have reached the peak, not by as much as we've seen in America, because they've been able to benefit from... They have their own power supplies, their own fracking gas and burn fuel. So we haven't got the benefit of that. So ours still remains relatively high. But the month-on-month -month inflation figures start... The high figures start dropping off now. Mm. So it'll be lower so next year. So inflation, in your view, has already peaked? It's, I think it's already peaked. And so if you look at the ones which are now be dropping off as, as you've had the 12 months. Mm. Those are some of the worst months we've had. But you're not going to see much. It's going to look pretty anemic growth. Mm. What the government should be doing, if you're saying, look, we've got two years to get it right, show the economy with low inflation now, interest rates steady, um, and the beginnings of steady growth, not just in London, but throughout the rest of the country. And that's to be one of the problems, as ever. It's very, very, very London-focused. Mm. Broad. There's no shortage of money in this country. It's just that we're very bad at getting invested in those, in those regions. I suppose there are some reforms that the government is trying to do. Solvency 2 is that big yeah. investment thing that sounds complicated, but basically pension funds will be able to invest more in British infrastructure. I, I suppose, looking at everything in the round, just finally in this conversation, there's a path, isn't there, to getting back to growth, to getting back to sort of a stable, uh, low-inflation economy. 
How likely is it? No, it, it actually is quite likely, as long as the government actually takes it uh, steadily and doesn't try to go for a sort of quick, high-growth, knee-jerk reactions. Make sure you've actually got a tax system which is encouraging people to invest, a tax system which is encouraging investors as well because they think they can get reasonable longer-term returns, help the pension funds broaden out and to be investing in Britain. And it's funny when you see in pension funds how much isn't, you know, even local authorities, they don't invest in their own areas. So, and make that easier, create the tax incentives so there's more reward for investors mm. to be able to put money in. At the moment, you've only got some of that, like enterprise investment schemes and things like that. There's a lot more. Make that exciting, and they can then point to steady growth. Well, I'm glad that we could end this conversation on something that is a little bit more positive than the way we began it. There is a path there. There's a possibility. Justin Urquhart Stewart, thank you so much Hopefully. for joining us on the briefing this morning. Well, from one uh, slightly dour topic to another. I want to talk about demography a looming problem that, if not addressed, will mean higher taxes and ever-worsening public services to boot. The UK population is simply not replenishing itself. Back in the 1950s and 60s, we experienced, of course, a baby boom that peaked at three children per woman, meaning a large cohort of people are approaching retirement in the next few years. Indeed, more than ever before. And people are living longer, too. By 2066, an extra 8.6 million people will be over the age of 65. And the proportion aged 85 and over is projected to double by 2041. And get this, treble by 2066. Now, these facts are not problems in and of themselves. People living longer, healthier lives is indisputably a good thing. Less early death benefits society. Bigger families are often stronger families, allowing for sustainable non-state-based support networks. A society with more older people in it isn't the issue. No, the issue is an ageing society, and there's a crucial distinction. It's not the number of older people in society we need to be concerned about, but the ratio of young to old. It's not the boom that's bad, it's the bust. Why is that? Well, one obvious reason is pensions. The median salary contributes just one quarter of the cost of the state pension through their national insurance contributions. So using that crude measure of median annual national insurance contributions, you need four people in work to fund one person who's retired. That's for the state pension alone, before we even consider NHS costs. And with pensions rising, the cost is getting higher. Sadly, as things stand, far too many people have been living under the surprisingly widely held misapprehensions that pensions have already been paid for, that they've already filled up some safe deposit box somewhere for their own state pension. Unfortunately for all of us, national insurance is not and has never been a savings account. It's a Ponzi scheme. There's no pension saving pot that this money has been paid into. Instead, the cash raised through national insurance is spent at the time it is raised. It simply acts as a devious double income tax. In fact, politicians have deceived and done over pensioners for decades by painting this false impression that they were saving for themselves. The truth is, as with any proper Ponzi scheme, the national insurance contributions of those retiring have long since been spent. When the 65-year-olds of today were paying their national insurance in decades past, it was funding the social services of the retirees of decades past. Bluntly, in order to avoid this pyramid falling over, it needs to be wider at the bottom than it is at the top. In order to fund growing demand for the important promises, like pensions, like NHS care, there has to be a growing supply of people in work actually paying for them. And frankly, as things stand, there just isn't. The birth rate has collapsed to just 1.6, well below societal replacement levels. A recipe for demographic disaster that cannot simply be plugged by higher and higher migration forever. It's a bleak picture. Yet, perhaps most interestingly here, this isn't what women want. Study after study has shown that there are what's called fertility intentions, and they're higher than fertility outcomes. The research suggests that women want to have more children than they feel able to have in our economy. 
we're hurtling towards ever more creaking social services, the real risk of pension and NHS funding shortfalls. And in order to avoid things getting significantly worse as the largest baby booming wave retires, we need to urgently remove those barriers to women having the families that they want. Well, what are those barriers? Let's explore more with GB News political reporter Olivia Utley, who joins us outside the Department of Health. And Olivia, it is the most remarkable thing to have seen the rate at which people are having children fall and fall and fall. What might be behind it? Yeah, absolutely, Tom. As you say, most demographers are now agreed that we are in the grip of a baby bust with uh, the average births per woman now at just 1.6. That is a long way below replacement level. The experts that I've talked to name two main reasons for this decline, although there are definitely other reasons as well. The two main ones are the cost of housing. Uh, 30 years ago, it was possible for a young woman in her 20s uh, to get married, buy a house with her husband, often on just one income. Now, that is completely impossible. The ratio between the average salary and the cost of the average house has just soared in recent years. Obviously, house building isn't keeping up with the rate of people coming into the country. There's a dearth of houses. And that means that getting into a position where you're able to buy your house and start a family is harder than it has been before. Another key reason which demographers identify is the cost of childcare, which in England is actually the highest of anywhere in the whole of Europe. The reasons for that appear to be a problem with essentially red tape around childcare. In other countries, it's quite easy for a childminder to register and a childminder can take on four children under three in France, for example. In England, childminders have to go through a whole host of Ofsted inspections, even if they're looking after just under threes. And they're only allowed to have two children under the age of two which means that childcare is very expensive for parents and childminders aren't paid that well. Then we also have the problem of nursery, where you've got uh, the government pays for 30 hours of free childcare when a child is over three, but obviously there's a big gap between when a mother finishes her maternity leave and when that, that pay starts to kick in. So having a child has become extremely expensive for young women, which means that they're putting it off later and later. And as you say, that means that the number of children that a woman wants to have just is not correlating with the number of children that she is having. It's a really fascinating prospect. Let's start firstly with those uh, childcare issues, because in France, that, that ratio of people providing the childcare to the number of children they can look after, that's twice as large as it is in England for under twos. Presumably, if we just copied the French rules, we could have childcare that was crudely half as cheap or twice as expensive. Yeah, absolutely. And for years, the question has been around safety. But when you're seeing uh, childminders in, in other parts of Europe, uh, uh, doubling that, that ratio and not seeming to have any safety problems, then there does seem to be an incentive for the, for the government to change this. Um, it's one of these issues which is never sort of top of the government agenda. With the Conservative government, we know that uh, the average Conservative voter is now well into their 40s, beyond the age of looking after small children. And so the incentives don't seem to line up for the government to change that. Although we do know that a big major problem for the Conservatives at the upcoming election is that young women specifically aren't voting for them. So we change those childcare ratios now, cutting through that red tape and making childcare cheaper for, the, for, for young women and, and young families could be a big vote winner for the Conservatives, so they might, may not realise it yet. It is remarkable that family policy doesn't seem to be so at the forefront of the minds of, of what is a, a Conservative party, the party that you would think is all about family and, and historically has all been about housing. Uh, Olivia Utley, thank you so much for joining us this morning and talking through what is an issue we do not talk about enough in our politics. Well, finally today, is it time to elect the House of Lords? The Speaker of the House of Commons, Lindsay Hoyle, certainly doesn't seem to think so. Sir Lindsay said it would undermine the authority of the House of Commons and expressed his opposition to Labour's plan to replace the House of Lords with an elected chamber. He also praised the work of the Lords, arguing they tidied up bills that had been sped through Parliament by MPs. Certainly an unusual intervention by this Speaker, although 
looking at speakers past, perhaps we should be uh, not that surprised that uh, speaker sometimes jabs and awe into domestic policy. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined now by Dr Richard Johnson, senior politics lecturer at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, and, and Richard, I suppose it's... I suppose we shouldn't be particularly surprised that the guy who's running the elected House doesn't want to see the Commons watered down to some extent by an elected Lords. That's right, Tom. It, and it's not unusual for a Speaker to try to defend the prerogatives and the position of the House of Commons within our constitutional system. We see this more frequently at the moment in terms of clashes between the Speaker and the government of the day. And the Speaker sometimes does tell off the government for not respecting the House of Commons. We've seen it much less in terms of bicameral clashes, clashes between the House of Commons and the House of Lords, precisely because at the moment, the, the, the way that the House of Lords positions itself within our system is quite a deferential one to the House of Commons. And quite, you know, I think Lindsay Hoyle is making quite a straightforward point here, which is that if you give the House of Lords or whatever it's called, a Senate, an elected mandate, it will use that mandate to try to challenge the elected mandate of the House of Commons. I, I suppose we do talk about the United Kingdom being what's called a bicameral parliament, two chambers. But, but, but in many ways, it, it, it doesn't really work as a bicameral parliament. To some extent, you could argue it's, it's closer to a unicameral parliament, having just one senior chamber. Unlike in the United States, where you have real bicameralism, the Senate ch um, challenging the House of Representatives, bills being stuck, there being gridlock, as it's described very often. In the United Kingdom, if the Commons want something, it gets passed. Yes, I think that's a very important point. I mean, in, in a sense, we have functionally a unicameral system, if not one in form. In the political science literature, people talk about veto players or veto points. So these are um, institutions whose consent is required to get legislation through and can use that to veto or block legislation. And although the House of Lords does have some delaying power, in, in, in fact, the House of Lords' ability to kill legislation that has majority support in the House of Commons mm. uh, is very weak. And so most political scientists actually classify Britain as just having one veto player, which is a majority in the House of Commons. That's interesting, although I suppose people looking at the House of Lords might think that this is an anachronistic uh, organisation. There are 70 people in there who are there by birthright. There are uh, people who seem to be have appointed uh, b perhaps by being rather too close or donating perhaps too much money to political parties. It doesn't look like the most clean organisation on the planet. Is Labour on to something in terms of wanting to change it in some way? I mean, I think, you know, this, it's, it's, this, these are easy points to make. And I mean, the argument that I would make is that, um, first of all, the, the, this kind of unelected nature of it is what ensures the protection of the House of Commons. So we have to think about this in terms of the relationship to the House of Commons. I think the Brown Review, one of the problems with it, this is the proposals for Labour's reforms, didn't really think about how Brown's suggestions of refining other institutions would play on the House of Commons. The safeguard of the House of Commons is some of this kind of what we would see as, you know, uh, you know semi-ridiculous elements of the House of Lords, like the bishops and the hereditaries. Once you start to kind of professionalise it and refine it, uh, you know, you can do a bit of that. But I think the more that you do that, the more that it gets a sense of itself that it can then use to overpower the House of Commons. Well, really, really interesting stuff there. Perhaps, perhaps there are unintended consequences of sweeping reform to these institutions. After all, the Labour Party dived into devolution at the end of the 90s, and perhaps that's had some unintended consequences too. Dr Richard Johnson, thank you for joining us this morning on The Briefing. That's it for me today. Uh, join me again tomorrow morning at 9.30. But up next, it's Bev Turner today. Good morning, I'm Alex Deakin and this is your latest weather forecast from the Met Office. Bit of a foggy start in places, staying fairly damp, misty and murky across the south today, whereas further north we should see some brighter skies. Low pressure is moving away from the north, 
hence why it'll be drier than yesterday. But further south, we've got a whole host of weather fronts just gradually edging in, bringing outbreaks of rain and drizzle across a good part of England and Wales. Eastern air is starting dry, but it is, as I say, quite misty and murky, some fog around, especially on some higher routes. Brighter skies for Scotland and Northern Ireland, but northerly winds setting in, bringing uh, more showers across the far north of Scotland, falling as snow uh, at times across the Northern Isles. No chance of that further south. It'll be rain and drizzle because it is really mild here, 11, 12 degrees Celsius. But it is turning colder again across northern Britain with those winds starting to pick up once more, though generally the winds, uh, certainly for northern England, northern Ireland, are a lot lighter than yesterday. During this evening, I think we're not going to see a great deal of change. Those northerly winds still bringing some showers in across northern Scotland. Might turn a bit icy as temperatures fall away, but further south it stays murky, misty again. Some fog in places and rain returning to the far southwest by the end of the night. Very mild here. Temperatures may stay in double figures, but colder conditions setting in further north. And that north-south split continues into Friday morning. This band of rain could be pretty heavy. A lot of people hitting the roads on Friday, so just bear that in mind. It's going to generate a lot of spray and surface water spreading from south to north, getting into northern England and northern Ireland, southern Scotland by the end of the day. Further south, it should brighten up during Friday afternoon. Still pretty mild here as well, although it will at times be windy. And again, got that big contrast between north and south. Low single figures across the uh, north, much milder conditions further south. The milder air winds out through the Christmas period for all areas, mostly looking fairly grey for Christmas, but then it could well turn colder and brighter during Christmas Day from the northwest. Join me, Calvin Robinson, on Christmas Eve and day to explore how this special period has become a source of hope with an especially festive show. Expect